Lord in this place, amen. I just give, uh, can everyone just give a round of applause, amen. That we were able to be in his house, to be able to be here, amen. God is amazing. His presence is everything we need. Amen. And everyone can just open their Bibles to 2 Timothy. Uh, we're going to be reading chapter 1, verse 7, amen. Let me say that one more time. 2 Timothy. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Amen. Who's having a wonderful day today? Amen. Because I am. Amen. Right. Good. It's amazing to be in this place. It's amazing to just hear what God has done and for us these past few days. We just had a vigil on Friday. And wow, just an amazing, amazing, powerful preaching by an evangelist who came. His name is Jesse. Wow. How God uses him immensely when you pray and you put God first before anything else. You just have to pray. Doesn't matter how hard the situation gets, Pastor. Doesn't matter how hard it gets, but we have to pray with confidence. And even though we go through the desert, we have to continue praying. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, it says here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God gave us the spirit not to not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Amen. God gives us the power. Of love and self-control. God does not make us fear, but He makes us love. God right. makes us have control over ourselves. Amen. We just have to believe and have confidence in God and we can see what God can do in our lives. Amen. Hallelujah. Who here is ready to hear the word of God? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Everyone could just bow their heads under that. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for what you have done for us in today, God. Well, all the things you have gifted us with, God. An amazing day, an amazing life, God. That we have another day to live, another hour to be in your house, God. That we can take everything we can, God, and be able to hear your word, even though it might be our last time, God. But I believe that we're going to learn something, God. I believe that you're going to do something special in this place, God. And you're going to see, Lord, your hand be moved in this place. Open our hearts and minds that we can understand your amazing word, God. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Our pastor with us now, amen. Amen, praise the Lord. And that is to the angel. Thank God for being here. Praise the Lord. You can open your scriptures to the book of John chapter 8, verse 31. This morning, we're going to begin with this verse this morning. And we have a great message. I am free. I am free. Love the message. Love the message. Love the word. Uh, I am free. That's probably going to be the topic for this today. And we can open the scriptures to the book of um, John chapter uh, 8, verse 32. And the Bible reads as follows. Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They responded, we are Abraham's children. We've never been anyone's slaves. How can you say that we will be set free? Jesus answered, I assure you that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave isn't a permanent member of a household, but a son is. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you really will be free. Praise the Lord. We'll be seated this morning. Thank you for praying for us. I want you to notice that there's a conversation between the Jewish community that actually believed in Jesus. There's a whole gathering and they actually, you know, believe in the word of the Lord. And the Lord is going to come in and preach to them, right? A little bit about, this, about, about the captivity, the spiritual captivity. And there's nothing more worse than somebody that's in denial, right? They're, they're captive, but they deny being in captivity. So they jump with this group of Jewish people that were saying, oh, we have never been captive, we've never had these issues, we have no problems. And you know, they, they were trying to simulate this to a physical captivity, but Jesus was trying to talk to them about sin, about the sinful nature that surrounds us all, that we are all uh, open to. And then at the particular moment, they were also being captured by the Roman Empire, right? And they were completely being dominated by them. So they were actually in part of the slavery, but in a way they were part free. But Jesus is going to come in to talk to them, not about the physical aspect of being captured or being saved, but the spiritual realm, right? Or their nature being captured. And God is going to come and speak to them. He's going to come and offer them liberty through his death and resurrection. He's trying to preach to them of a sin. And if you notice, one thing that Jesus came to do is, my point one, number one this morning is going to be, Jesus set us free from sin, right? We're all captive to sin. Now, sin is a very dangerous weapon from the enemy because Satan uses this to destroy humanity. Sin destroys family. Sin destroys a spiritual life. Sin comes and destroys man. It comes to give him destructive behavior. It, gives, it causes shame, uh, uh, bitterness, sadness. It takes him captive into, you know, a different type of addiction, whether it's drugs, alcohol, 
pornography, lying, all kinds of different uh, type of different pleasure that you may get out of it. But at the end of the day, you know, many see you set free from sin. And sin is a very, very vital uh, weapon from the enemy because through sin, you know, the enemy comes and lies to humanity and makes them think that everything's okay. They believe that they are doing what they desire. They're doing their life the way they want to. But in reality, they're captive with sin, right? Their, their will is captive. They say, you know, I could quit beer. I could quit alcohol. I could do whatever I want when I lie. But in reality, they can't. They're captive, you know, to their eternal addiction, whether it's, you know, lying, cheating, pornography, whether it's masturbation, you name it, right? There's all kinds of different destructive ways of, of practicing sin. So humanity had been captive up to this point. When Jesus comes and talks to this uh, group of men, men knew about the law, men knew how to follow Moses' law, but the law itself could liberate you from sin. The law just showed you what sin was, right? And people like the, like the law, the, the boundaries of, you know, don't cross the red light, don't do this, don't do that. But the law itself couldn't transform the behavior from humanity in their heart. People just were, they were very aware of what the law was. They knew what was right, what was wrong, yet they couldn't help themselves. And Jesus is going to come and present an open door for whoever wants to come into the in, in, into the forgiveness of sins. And he's going to come and try to teach this, this Jewish community about liberation of sin. But the people that are, talk, that are talking with him, they're very stubborn, right? They know the law. They're a Jewish community. They're, they're practicing, they're, they're, they're practicing the law so they knew it. And they say, you know, we're, we're not captive. We're, we're, we are perfectly free. You know, we don't, we don't need help with that. Where, you know, as a matter of fact, our, our father is Abraham, right? He was the great man of faith. That's our father. And, you know, Jesus is going to come in and, and reassure them because in John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus gives them the answer. He says, Jesus answered, I assure you that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, you know, uh, sin has governed men for long forever. You know, sin has been in humanity, the DNA, in women. Anybody that has not accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to set them free, most likely they're under the captivity of sin. Where, whatever the the, uh, the behavior, whatever the, uh, the the desire of sin is, that's up to everybody in particular. But sin has taken men captive. And it doesn't matter men say, you know, I am not captive to sin. You know, sin doesn't have control of me. Where they're in denial, they say, I'm just fine, everything's good. But you see, the outcome of sins of families destroyed. You see the outcome of sin of people being so far apart from God. They can't connect. They can't pray. There's no personal relationship because a sin was was set you apart from God. And notice that God comes and preaches to them and tells them, you know what? People that are they serve sin, they're a slave to the sin, right? They they can't be free. And you know, I can relate to this because if you're familiar with the Spanish culture. Every year uh, on the Spanish culture, we celebrate Lent, right? It's Lent, the thing's called Lent Week. And in Lent Week, many people in different parts of the world, they will promise to give alcohol, they will promise to do certain rituals, they will promise to do certain areas of their life to be better, they will promise their mom, they will promise their dad, you know, I'm not going to say bad words, I'm not going to go out, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to cheat on you. And meanwhile, many people, they know, they know things are wrong, they will promise things, but at the end of the day, they will go back to what they tried to live before, they will leave alcohol for four months, but then the day when the, when the Lent week is over, they will go back and just, just drown all the alcohol and drink and forty and those 40 days, they'll finish it up there. Humanity has become a puppet of sin. Sin manipulates their conscience, sin, sin manipulates their feeling, their, 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 their willpower. Sin takes control of their entire life. Sin is a, it's a weapon from the enemy that comes and just destroys people little by little. So these people, uh, Jesus is coming to talk to the Jewish community to try to help them come, come, out, come out of the situation. And you notice that sin throughout history has stopped humanity from two things. One is getting close to God, and the other one is from being blessed from God. Those are, those are the causes of effect of sin. And you're going to see this in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 23. That verse reads as follows. Oh, perfect. Thank you. It says, but, but your misdeeds have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that you aren't heard. Your hands are stained with blood, and your fingers with guilt. Your lips speak lies, your tongues mutter malice. Notice that sin, you know, it's a matter of getting the heart hard, right? When you, when sinful nature takes over and humanity gets attacked by sin, you know, they don't want to get come close to God. They don't want to talk to God. They don't feel like doing it because their heart is hard. Every time people go and sin and do bad things, they lose the sensitivity to come and connect with God. Sin will stop you from being able to worship God. Sin will stop you from connecting to the presence of God. Sin will stop the blessing 
but most importantly, sin separates God from humanity. If you notice right now, people are very far from, from worshiping God. I mean, in this own schools that we have nowadays around the United States of America, before they used to begin with worship, with prayer, with connection with God, but you see nowadays they're trying to they're, they're trying to bring in you know same 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 sex gender. They're trying to find the uh, you know liberation of transgenders. They could identify as they will. You know they don't want they don't want to pray. They don't want to connect with God. But in those same schools, they're able to practice white magic, blue magic, yellow magic, and little by little sin uh, parts and away from the presence of God. It is very important that you see how Isaiah says, you know, look, look at look at your look at your behavior, the way you your behavior. You want to you want to connect with God. And you notice the context of this text in verse uh, chapter fifty six. They have they have been fasting, they have been praying, but then God comes and tells them, right? Because they, they tell God, you know, God, why aren't you hearing us? Why aren't you listening to us? Why aren't you answering our prayers? And God is a very straightforward for what God is saying, you know, you have done what's wrong while you're in disobedience, you're not following my ways, you're doing whatever you want, you fast, but then you do whatever you want, you're, you're doing bad business, you're not doing things right. And you know, there's a whole conversation with them. So you notice the sin is a problem for humanity because sin has always separated humanity from, from, from God. Now, and to, up, to, up to the point that Jesus came, humanity had no choice because they knew the law, they knew what was right, they knew what was wrong, but that's it. You know, that they just knew what was right and what was wrong. But Jesus comes to open up a different door. So number one, the number one thing that Jesus does is he gives us uh, he gives us liberation from uh, from our sins, right? He sets us free. Because in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, the text says this. A person's selfish desires are set against the spirit, and the spirit is set against one's self -desi selfish desires. They are opposed to each other, so you shouldn't do whatever you want to do. In other words, there's a fight, right, between the two natures within ourselves to do what's right, to do what's wrong. Has that ever happened to you that you know what's right, you know what to do, but you kind of have an inner fight within yourself, like an inner war? I mean, has that, has that only happened to me? Has that, can anybody identify, right? Like, you know what's right, you know what's wrong, but inside of you, there's a fight, right? There's two natures. There's the good nature and the bad nature. And sometimes in television, you see that the, the little... Uh, uh, met met of metaphor, right? You have a little angel here, you have the little devil here, and they're both kind of trying to give ideas, and you're kind of crying in the middle. That's exactly what Paul is going to tell us about sin. If you follow me along in Romans chapter 7, 21 to 25, you know, look at this conversation that Paul tells us. Paul says, So I find it as a rule, when I want to do what is good, it was right there with me. I gladly agree with the laws on the inside, but I see different law at work in my body. It wages a war against the law of my mind and takes me prisoner with the law of sin that is in my body. I am miserable, a human, a human being. Who will deliver me from this dead corpse? Thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that I am a slave to God's law in my mind, but I'm a slave to sin, to, to sin's law in my body. Notice the Paul says, I got a conflict, I got a problem, right? I know what is right, I know what I should do, but yet, you know, my, my, my outer body, my outer nature wants to do what is wrong. I got a problem, I can't be set free, I'm in a conflict consistently with myself, I know exactly what to do, and the reality is that, you know, our humanity likes to do what is bad, right? I mean, our nature itself, you know, likes to sleep in, likes to hang out, likes to go party, likes to go, you know, uh, sexual morality. Uh, our, our, our nature within itself with this vision with all kinds of different desires in our minds and sin is trying to come it's come, comes to try to take humanity captive right even though we know what is right we know what we should do sometimes we have the conflict and Paul says you know I have the conflict right I know exactly what to do when my mind I serve God I know that in my heart my mind I should serve God how many know how many here I would agree that you want to serve God here we all want to serve God here. We're all here this morning. You're not here because you want to see me. You're here because you want to serve God and you want to better your spiritual life and praise the Lord for that. But I want you to notice that in through this teaching, the God identifies a big problem of humanity. He identifies sins, right? And notice the sin is it, uh, how, how they hold the humanity until Christ came. When Christ came, he broke the he broke the boundaries, he broke the barriers, he broke the chains that sin had us held by because this. People that he's talking to, even though they were captive, Jesus preached them about sin. He said, you know, you can't be captive to sin. And up to that point, you know, sin had a good grip on humanity. Up to that point, human, humanity only knew what was good and what was bad. But they had no idea how to set themselves up 
free from sin until Jesus showed up. And when Jesus shows up, you know, he sets them free from sin. His blood at the cross of the Calvary came to offer forgiveness of sins. His uh, blood at the cross of the Calvary came to offer you liberation from sin. So you can see what is right and what is wrong. And you can have a different arm in your hands except for willpower. Because up to this point, people only had willpower. Tell your neighbor, willpower. Willpower is what we have, right? And willpower is strong to do certain things. Certain people can, can, can commit and get up in the morning, go exercise and their willpower. Other people will take a class, they'll take a course, they'll finish their seminar, they'll finish their career because their willpower was very strong. And that's good, right? You do certain positive things or, or vice versa. You got a you gotta weak willpower and you just give up, right? You get up in the morning, you know, this year I'm going to lose weight. It's starting January 2023. I'm going to the gym every single day. You, you set up, you set up the the goals and you start going the first day, you start going the second day, but on the fourth day you rain, you know, instead of rain, I think I'm going to take a rain shake, I'm just going to sit down, have some little you know, coffee, some chocolate, some little, you know, or some bread, I'm going to call this my cheat day, right? And then next week comes up, you have to send another cheat day, a little bit, little bit of willpower just goes away and you kind of you know, get into the comfort zone. Now, up to this point, people were in the comfort zone with sin, right? Because they knew what sin was, they knew the law, but the law has no strength to help them be liberated. But when Jesus appears in the scenery, he offers them salvation, he offers them freedom from sin. And if there is one that could offer salvation to a better life and a better way of connecting with God is Jesus Christ. And if you have friends, you have families, you should tell everybody, you know, there is no more wages of sins. They're gonna, they're, they cannot kill you. He cannot hurt you because Jesus can set you free from the malice behavior. Jesus could correct the bad, the, the bad pattern of behavior that you have. Jesus could set you free from, you know, either uh, addictions, from either, uh, you know, uh, hurtful emotions or toxic environments. Because at the end of the day, when you practice sin, and sin is part of your life, sin will have a fruit in your life. Sin doesn't just come and just hangs out with you. Sin will help you produce something in your life. And this is what sin produces in people's lives. If you follow along on the, on the board, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21 says this. Sin will always produce a bad behavior, bad, bad, bad system of behavior in your life. And the Bible says this. The actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious. Since they, are in, since they include sexual morality, moral corruption, doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use, and casting spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper, competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, party, and other things that are like, like that. I warn you, as I have already warned you, that those who do this thing, kind of things won't inherit God's kingdom. Notice that this is a human behavior, right? Human behavior with that God will simply produce a type of behavior. That Nothing you can do. The person's not evil. The person's not bad. This is the fruit of, it, of, of, of sin in people's lives. It will help them go wild and crazy for a little bit. It will be okay, but then the end result will not be good. Notice, notice the difference between this behavior and the Holy Spirit behavior in people's lives. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, we'll show the difference between the willpowers, right? And your willpower, this is what you're going to have. You can try to serve God. You can do the best that you could. You could you, you try to do without without letting God be fully in your, in, in, in your life, but when you have your willpower, your, power, your willpower will eventually fall a little short. But the difference is this, that before people had only willpower, now God goes a little further than just giving you willpower. Now God lives in you. And when God lives in you, you have a little strength that calls the willpower of God, right? The willpower of Jesus. So when Jesus comes into your heart, He lives in your mind, He lives in your heart, you have your willpower, but He gives you the extra strength that you need to win and to defeat whatever temptation, whatever sin is trying to come into your life. Because look at the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, the Bible says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. There is no law against things like this. In other words, you know, the, the two natures that we have, are you going to indulge in, 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 in this type of behaviors or are you going to let God come into your life and set you free, right? So set you free from, uh, you know, destructive behaviors and, you know, sin is an arm that had you captive. You know, sin is something that humanity captive for many thousands of years and every time humanity tried to rise and tried to do what was right, sin will come, you say, you know, take control of their hands, take control of their minds and just take them captive, right? Take them captive, just bring them down and bring them down. They knew what was right, they knew what was wrong. The Jewish community definitely knew what was the law, right? The law would identify the sin, but he give you no, no help. If you guys ever ever watched um, cartoons a long time ago, if you have, you know, you get a little older. Have you guys ever watched Popeye? 
Long time ago, right? Papa was a was a, was a cartoon, right? and, and, and the whole idea behind Papa is that he will fight this guy named East Pluto, right? That was his name. And you know, and all the uh, others, right? All of that was his girlfriend. And then you know, uh, Pluto was trying to take his girlfriend. And then when they got into a fight, you know, uh, Pluto would come and beat up Popeye, and you know, he'll be all knocked down. And the only way Papa would have his strength is he gave him what? He had to give him his spinach, right? His spinach. So you get the little candy you put in his mouth, and you know, he'll get uh, strong and just be able to defeat all his friends and his enemies. And that's exactly the way I see the Holy Spirit, right? You have your real power. You can fight. You can try. You can try to do the best that you can. You put up a good fight. You know, you try to do the best that you can. But most of the time, will fall short. But in the moment you fall short, you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to your life, and He pumps you up. He brings you up, and He can give you victory. God will set you free from any boundaries, from any bondage, from any problem, from any sin. There is nothing, absolutely nothing in this world that God cannot set you free from. When God comes, He breaks all the chains, all the bondage. Where there's a cultural, you know, uh, uh, mindset that you're feeling destructive, you're feeling suicidal, you have problems, you have, and you're feeling sad. You know, God comes in and with His strength and His power, He sets you free completely. Point number two. Jesus came to set us free from our own selves, right? From our own selves. Jesus came to give us freedom from our own personal emotions because we all experience different type of uh, problems in life, right? We go into society, we, we, we have falls, we have problems, we experience, we, you know, sometimes through sin we get hurt, and that leaves some, some, some residue behind us, right? Some people get stuck with sadness, right, in their heart because of their family, because of their culture, because of the mistake they did. There's people that will never forgive themselves because they did something 10 years ago, and every day, every single day in the morning, they come and relive it, right? What I did in 2015. What did I do in 2005? Why did I do this? Why did I do that? So Jesus comes to sets us free from our own destructive emotions and behavior, right? Because, you know, that you can know what is right. You can know what is wrong. You can even identify the problem, but sometimes you can't get rid of the problem. So God comes in and sets us free from the destructive emotions that are having built in our lives. He also gets rid of all that guilt, right? I mean, how many of us have ever felt guilty for something you did from your past? Have you ever felt guilt trip, right? You have a guilt trip, have a guilty conscience. So, you know, sometimes that we can't Carry the dead burden in, in, in our shoulders, and and the, and the, and the Roman uh, culture. There's a very uh, a, a good teaching about this. The Roman culture, what they did is when they caught it, when they had a, a, a slave, and then they had another slave that came in and did some, they did something bad in their empire. What they did is you'll get a dead corpse and tie it to the live person. Yes, tie him up. So what would happen is that dead corpse will eventually start killing the live person that was tied to them, right? And that's what guilt does. That's exactly what, you know, all, 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 uh, you know, guilt trip and, and you know, fear, and, you know, this toxic emotions. You tie them to yourself and you walk every day with them. Every day you walk with them and they're tied to you and you're going to work and you're going to school and you're going with your life and you're going with things you're doing, but you have the dead corpse tied to yourself, which eventually will down you, right? Eventually it's going to kill you, it's going to hurt you. So Jesus came to set us free from our own personal destructive behavior that was killing us and hurting us from guilt, from uh, from guiltiness, from uh, you know, from being sad, from being thoughts, right? Thoughts that are completely out of control. Have you ever had your mind out of control? And like you're sitting somewhere, but your mind is going a hundred thousand miles per hour, right? You're thinking of stuff, but there's positive, bad stuff, and just thoughts out of control will completely hurt you all the time because your your mind is the big the biggest asset you have. And if you don't have peace in your mind, your whole being won't have peace, right? You could be in the most beautiful hotel, you could be in the most beautiful place, but if in your mind you're in trouble, if you're not peaceful, you don't feel rest, you're gonna feel unease. Because I think the problem is that is that outside the problem starts inside of us. There was a great technician and this guy had a nice big house. And you know, he was a very smart guy. His house was huge, and he bought a big TV, a huge TV from wall to wall, beautiful television. And he got there and he saw the TV and he couldn't turn it on. He's like, oh man, this TV doesn't turn on. So he brought his people and said, okay, move this TV to my upstairs mansion. So they bring the TV, they move it to the next place, they connect the television, they do all the right things to it, they turn it on, and the TV didn't work. This guy, I know, uh, he paid a lot of money for this television. So you know, he said, let's move this television to the bottom basement and I'm gonna have it there to see maybe the outlets. So they went through the whole process, the television doesn't work, a technician comes and inspects the television and then he tells, hey, my television's not working anywhere, I put it, well, what can I do? You know, I put it here, I plug it different ways, I put all the plugs and all the different tricks, it's not starting. And the technician tells him, your problem is very simple. Your problem is not, the, is not the outer connection, the problem is the inner connection. There is something wrong electrically in the television. You gotta take it to the shop so you can fix it and it can work anywhere you want it to work. And the guy did that, he they fixed the problem and he connected the television and other rooms and the television worked just fine. 
And that will teach us something that, you know, sometimes we, we you know, things got out of place, right? You're, you're in a certain place, everything's good, but, you know, you, you, things don't work out here, things don't work out in this other place, you know, you just don't feel good here, you don't feel good there, and you want to change this, you want to change that, and sometimes people say, I'm going for vacation, right? Because, I mean, we all go on vacation. The problem with vacation is that you take yourself to vacations too, right? You don't leave yourself at home. You don't, you don't leave your emotions. You don't tell yourself, you know, I'm going to take away my emotions, I'm going to take away my behavior, and yes, even here, and I'm going to take my core of vacation. So the problem with that is when you are consistently with you and you're carrying a dead course with you, you're consistently remembering, you're consistently punishing yourself, you're consistently carrying burdens in yourself. It's when things don't work out because the problem is not in the people outside, it's not in the geographical place, the problem is inside of us. Sometimes we're carrying things that we carry for such a long time and we haven't been set free. So Jesus comes to set us free from insecurities, from fear. He comes to set you free from anything that comes to hurt you because Jesus loves you. Don't even go for God. For Jesus, throughout the whole Bible, you know, there's one goal that Jesus has for humanity to be whole and for humanity to gain its value back. What God wants to do is make humanity happy and make him part of, of, of his own kingdom, but he wants to heal the hurt. If you know what this, the Bible says that in the context of the story that we read we this morning, there was a girl that was caught in, in adultery. You guys remember the story, right? She was out there, she was about to get stoned, right? And everybody gets her, gets around her, right? I mean, they talk about destructive emotions, talk about destructive behavior, and talk about sin, and talk about everything coming together in this woman's life, right? So they bring her out, and when they bring her out, they put her right in the middle. I mean, think about it, right? She's already being caught in adultery. She's already being filled with shame. She's already feeling insecure. And then everybody's just looking at her, right? Can you imagine the feelings and the stress and the hurt she's going through? And then the public shame, right? Everybody's there. And then above all things, everybody had a walk on it, right? I mean, they really had a walk. And the Jewish community had really mastered the way to throw stone because they had been doing that for such a long time. And that's what sin will do. Sin will put people in, in blacks, right? Sin will people, sin will people in this position that they have no more, no more salvation, no more way, no, no way to get out of it. The only thing sin will do is just come put in the spot and kill your spiritual life, kill your morality, kill, kill anything that will possibly be within hope within yourself. So this woman is there in the middle of the whole circle, and people have stones, right? They're getting ready to stone her. And then they asked Jesus, right? And God blessed Jesus, right? Because man, they would have killed that woman right there. They would just, they, they would just waited. They asked Jesus, not because they cared about what Jesus said. They asked Jesus because they wanted to get him in trouble and they wanted to also kill him. They asked him, what should we do, Jesus? Because the law says we should stone this woman. You know, she's been caught in adultery. She broke it. This is the problem. This is the condemnation. That's what, that's what the law does. And that's what, that's what sin does. Sin will bring about condemnation. But, the Bible says that Jesus comes and tells him, okay, he's going to the stoner, right? He says, no problem. Let me let, 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 let me just do something real quick. Let me know the story. He gets down on the floor and he starts writing things down on the floor. He starts writing things down on the floor. As he starts writing things down on the floor, the people that are around there, they come and they look over him. And many people have different translation or interpretation of what he was writing. One, one commentary said that he was writing the Ten Commandments, and he said, if anybody here has not broken the Ten Commandments, yet go ahead and throw the first rock. And then he starts writing the First Commandments, where people come and say, oh, you should not lie. Ooh, I lied. I, I'm not free from that one. Oh, I fornicate. Oh, I'm not free from that one either, right? So a little bit of they got confronted by the word. Other commentary, this is my favorite one, by the way. Other commentary said that what he wrote is he, everybody that was there ready to point the finger at this woman and ready to kill this woman because of the act of adultery she had committed. Has, has Jesus sat down on the floor and he started writing. And at the, one of the commentaries that I read said that he started writing the person's name with the sin he committed and the sin he committed. And he said, you know, if you're free of it, then go ahead and throw the first rock. And as this crowd started going, started seeing what he was reading, like, oh my God, that was my name. And I didn't commit the sin, you know, I'm good. I'm checking out of this one, right? You know, praise the Lord. And they all walked away. You know, the interesting part is that Jesus came to set us free from sin, from shame, from problem. He came to add value. He came to love us. He came to help us because sin had humanity captive. But praise the Lord for Jesus and praise the Lord for the blood and the cross of the Calvary to set us free from shame. And we could identify ourselves to this one because one point another we felt ashamed, right? I mean, we all have done things that make us feel ashamed. There's things in my life that I will never in my life testify because, you know, you, you feel ashamed of certain things, but God comes with his love, his care, and his mercy and sets us free. Because this woman, when she was sitting down and, and getting just waiting for the judgment, she says, woman, where are the people that are judging? Where are the
were the people that were about to kill you, and there was none of them. And he tells them, woman, go ahead and leave. Don't sin anymore, so the worst thing will come upon you. But the, the goal and the mission statement of Jesus is to add value to humanity. That's his first statement. He comes to help people. Imagine this young lady, right? She's all broken down. Her emotions are down. She feels ashamed. She feels bad. And notice that, notice the one-sided story, right? Because in this story, they brought the woman that was in adultery, but they never brought the man. You notice that, right? So the law was a problem with the law because the law could say, help you choose what you wanted to do. And then imagine when, it's, when Jesus comes and tells this girl, my daughter, right? She, he, re, he, he, he reincorporated her and gave her love, gave her care. He didn't come and tell her what you did was really bad. The sin that you did, wow, it was, it was hurtful and you, you broke a family. You, you know, how, can you, how can you possibly be an adulterer? No, no. God says, my daughter, you know, come, come to me. You have been regained. You have been restored. I'm here to make you whole. Can somebody give the Lord a hand to hand of for the love and that care that he has for us. And with that being said, I'll, I'll go to my last point. And I'm just going to touch this point real fast. If you notice, there's two, two natures within, within us, right? That God's natures and a human nature that we have. And we all struggle. There's not a single person that's going to come to this church and say, no, I never struggle with anything, you know. I wake up every morning, and I'm ready to go. I'm super spiritual, you know. I just get up and put it 100% that spiritual being in, and nothing can face me. Nothing can touch me. I believe that what Paul said was very honest. I believe that Paul himself, being one of the most influential people of the New Testament, he was so so honest is, you know, I get up every morning, every morning I got to fight a fight. Every morning I got to struggle with myself. Do I pray or do I not pray? Do I sin or do I not sin? Do I do things right or do I do not things right? What should I do? And every morning we all struggle, right? And we all make the decision to do what is right or to do what is wrong. Every single person, whether you're in church, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a minister, whether you're a brother or a newcomer or someone that is visiting church, we all struggle with decisions of what is right and what is wrong. In our daily lives. But I'll give a little teaching that, I, that, that God showed to me in the first Kings chapter 18, verse 30. Now, that, that particular verse is going to show us the different natures, right? Because in that story, in first Kings chapter 18, verse 30, Elijah is going to come into Israel, right? And the Jewish community had a problem. They were always going to problems when they went to part away from God, right? When the connection with God wasn't there, when they went to obey the vows and they went to do whatever they want, they forgot and neglected the presence of God. But 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 30 will give us an application to this. The Bible says this, He repaired the Lord's altar that had been damaged. I want you to notice the word. The altar represented connection. The altar represented relationship. The altar to the people of Israel represented a daily burnt offering and to the presence of God. But the Bible says in this context of the story that the one that was overseeing everything now was not God. The one that was blessing Israel was not God. They were flying into captive. Jezebel was taking care of She was taking control of the, of the whole region. It was a demonic a spirit that was, you know, bringing coldness into the, into the rival of God. And, you know, she was, she was had control of the area. And the valve started rising up, right? The, their, their, their system of behavior uh, took control of the area. And the Bible says that the altar was damaged. There was no prayer. There was no relationship with God. There was no coming to God. And the teaching is this, that if, that if your altar for God is not lit up, if your altar for God is not connected with God, and if the altar of God in your personal life is not uh, lit up with the fire of God, with, with prayer, with relationship with God, if you don't bring your flesh to burn in the altar, your flesh, your flesh will burn and destroy the altar of God, and your daily desires will rise upon you. Then your, your, your carnality will be strong. And when you, when you start to make a decision, instead of you burning the flesh, the flesh will kick the altar of God, and your flesh will make the decision for you. But when the fire of God is instant inside of you, and the altar is built, and the fire is burning, your flesh will die in the altar. Your flesh will burn those desires, right? Those bad thoughts, those behavioral systems that is taking out of control. Doesn't matter what it is, right? Whether it's pornography, whether it's addiction with drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's lying, whether it's cheating. Doesn't matter what it is. When you put your flesh in the altar, the flesh will burn. But when you don't put your flesh in the altar every morning, you don't connect with the presence of God, then your flesh becomes stronger, right? It's stronger and stronger and stronger, and it begins to rule you and guide you. Look at these people here. Look at this, this group of people here. They were they were they were self-sustained, right? They were they were blinded with sin. They couldn't see that they were captive to sin. You know, we're we're in denial, Jesus. You're trying to help us, but we're you know we're we're no sin. We're okay, you know. We're just fine. 
find who we are. We are not, we are not slaves. We're just fine. Matter of fact, we come from, from a prophetic background from Abraham. We're just fine. Jesus, that's what they told Jesus, right? And Jesus said, no, no, you got it all wrong. You're being captive by sin. You don't know it. And nothing worse than be in denial by yourself, right? Because really, in reality, you know, you can't really uh, uh, be, you know, God is not being fooled, right? The Bible says that God cannot be fooled. The only people that get fooled is, is ourselves. Now, they, these people right here, they were so, they, they, they were so uh, egocentric. They were just blinded by, by sin that they couldn't recognize their situation and they tried to hide, right? They tried to hide but in the reality. They, they had forgotten a couple of things. Politically, they were in bad shape, in bad shape, right? The Roman Empire had them captive, right? They were under, under, under the thumb of the, of, of the um, emperor at the time. They had been captive for 400 years in, in Egypt. They had been taken as slaves over to Babylon, right? They had been deported. So they had been all kinds of problems. The only thing they could it was set them free. They wanted to set them free was Jesus at the moment. And they, 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 they were not taking the help. They needed to take the help. But God came and offered them help from the blindness, from sin that were in, the, they were in, in that particular moment. And religion and life will offer you rituals, right? That's the problem with religion. Religion and relationship with God is a whole different thing, right? You could be part of a system of belief, doesn't matter what church, doesn't matter what building, doesn't matter what location, but you can be part of a religion with that in your relationship with God. The altars are not burning, the connections are there, and you can follow the rituals, you can follow the systematic behavior of the service or, or the event that you go to, but not have no connection with God. The problem with that is that your heart is being affected by the presence of God. When you enter a relationship with God, the Bible is very clear on John chapter 8, verse 32, and this will be my last point. The Bible says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth is that Jesus was telling them, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the walk, I am the one that can set you free from any problems, any cultural patterns, any cultural blindness, any cultural change you have from void. I can set you free, I can help you. The truth is, before Christ came into our lives, we were captive, right? We were blindsided by sin. We didn't realize what was destroying us. We did it. As, you know, we learned it from the father. We learned it from mom. We learned it from the culture. We learned it from friends. We learned it from MTV. We learned it from my system, from, from, our, from, from the society that we live in. But when Christ comes in, he shows us the truth, right? And the truth is that before Christ comes into our lives, sometimes we hit emotionally bankruptcy, right? Before Christ comes into our lives, we hit rock bottom, right? We have problems. We have issues. And you know, and when you when you get to know the truth, the truth is that humanity itself has been captured by sin. And it's that until Jesus comes to open a door that was heart is locked in. And when Jesus comes and opens this door, humanity itself can come out of the, the, the sinful nature. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, it says this. You have been bought and paid for to honor God with your body. This relation is great, but I love the Spanish relation. The Spanish tradition says that we have been paid for with blood, right? And then they emphasize in this particular text, saying that this text is applied to when somebody bought a slave in the market at the time. And when they bought the, the slave in the market, there was two ways you could buy a slave. One is you buy a slave temporary, to the point you buy the slave, and then you put it back in the market to reset them again, or you could just completely buy that slave for entirely. And if you buy the slave entirely, this particular slave could not be resold in the market again. And this particular text applied to that. It said that Jesus bought us from a slavery to set us completely free forever. You can never be sold, you can never regain, you can never re-enter into the market. Once Jesus buys you, he buys you, and he buys you, you are set free forever. That's anybody like to be free forever this morning? I might like to be free, right? So it's great to be free. And I'll just, I'll just I'll illustrate my whole entire message with this story, and I'll finish here. So, before he, before Christ ever comes into our lives, we had only our will, right? That's what we had, our will. We fought with our will, we did the best that we could. But our will was not enough because our will is so weak sometimes. It just, we try so hard, we, we do the best that we can, but sometimes we can't do it because we fall short of what our goal says and sin will come and take us right back into captivity. Prisoners, right? And, and prisoners will stay for a long time. And then we get a glimpse, yeah, I can do this and I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna try to do it. And you try to do it again and sin comes and just punch you right in the face and you go right back down and say, oh man, I tried this so many times, I can't try it anymore. And then that until God comes, in us and gives us his power to give us the strength to set us free. And the best way to illustrate this is this way. Long time, back in uh, back in back in the times uh, when people just you know uh, had Roman empires and they had like, empires to basically govern the, uh, the, the the cities and the and and, and the countries. You know, the, um, there was a story that I really liked, and this story says this: that in this festival, this king will come onto the bottom of the dungeons and he'll visit all the prisoners. 
And this king would set a prisoner free. Every year he could do this. Every, every, I'm sorry, every, every time of the festival, he was every 10 years, 8 years. So he'll come, and we went into the, into the bottom of the dungeons, he'll walk around, and then he'll talk to the people in the cells. And uh, that year, he went into the cells, and he went to the bottom, and the king started walking, and started walking, and he started walking, and he talked to the first one. King! I am a guilty king! I don't deserve to be in this, in the, in the, in the, in this cell. You know, please get me out. He walked to the next part. Yeah, you know, king, I was going to tell you that my lord showed himself. You know, even the lawyer's fault, it wasn't my fault. Kept on going forward. Goes to the king, you know, I'm innocent. You know, I am innocent. I'm an innocent person being falsely accused in prison. He walked right forward. And he gets to the one of the far end jail cells, and there was one man, and the one man just sat. He didn't come to the front. He didn't scream for help. He didn't ask him to set me free, which moved the king. He said, whoa. Young man says, come to the front. The young man comes to the front, shoulders down, feeling ashamed, feeling bummed out, and says, you know, uh, everybody here is, you know, basically pleading for clemency. Why aren't you pleading for clemency? What's going on? And the, and the, and, and the, and the prisoner turns to him and says, you know, honestly, I deserve to be here. You know, I'm a bad person. I did bad things. Honestly, I, I really deserve my sentence. I don't deserve to be out there. I don't deserve, you know, a second opportunity. I am bad. I did all those bad things. And honestly, you know, I am here for a justifiable reason. So therefore, you know, I don't, I, I don't deserve to come out. And the king gets the king and tells his soldiers, soldiers, open this gate and let him come out. And, you know, uh, this is, well, how can you let me out? Everybody's asking to, to, you know, everybody's asking to give you in a second opportunity. Why would you give me an opportunity when I tell you that I did something that is bad? He said, yes, but everybody here is looking for a reason and excuse why to excuse their behavior and what they did in the, when they were outside. And as soon as they come out, they're just going to go back to the, to the same thing they did there before. But in your case, you repented. You repented and you understood what went wrong. And because I have the power and authority to set you free, I'll set you free to give you a new opportunity. And that's how I see Jesus. Jesus set us free from sin and had us captive, right? We were captive in a jail cell. We made excuses. We lied to ourselves. We wished we could do things. But it came to the point in time that we had rock bottom. And when you have repentance, you understand that God is the only one that can help you. God comes and opens the door for you, right? Because you know what? It's okay. You did a lot of mistakes. You did a lot of wrong things. But you know, I am not a God that's going to come in and hate you because wrong things. I am a lovely father, right? That's going to come and help you to be successful and do what you need to do in life. And maybe I always understood this in a theory, theoretical way. But now that I have a little baby, it makes so much more sense to me, right? Because when you when your baby does something wrong, do you want to kill the baby? You're not going to kill your own baby. No. You get the baby. You hug the baby. You know, you try the best that you can for the baby to be successful. And now that I'm a father myself, I can identify myself a lot more with, with God being the father. Because now that I see the babies and all, if the baby did something wrong, I wouldn't want to hurt my baby. I would love my baby and help my baby accomplish their goals. And then when I, when I see the baby, I think to myself, the Bible says that we are evil fathers. We're not even good fathers. The Bible says that we are evil people in the nation, but we still do good deeds to our kids. The Bible says, imagine you're getting your heavenly father. So when I understand that, I understand that God has a key to open your door. God has a key to open my door. It doesn't matter if you want to come out, you want to remain in the, in, in the boundaries, you want to remain in bondages. The Bible says that God came to set us free. And I'm invite you to set your feet this morning. And an invitation for you this morning, right? Doesn't matter who you are, where you are, whether you're to social media, here in the century. You know, an invitation for you this morning. The king is passing through. He is seeing, you know, what can I do? What would you like to do this morning? You could choose not to come to Christ. You could choose not to let Jesus set you free. But I just want to tell you that Jesus loves you. I want to tell you that Jesus he came to earth to make you whole. And I want to tell you that it doesn't matter what has a hold of you. The moment Jesus shows up, that breaks right away. I mean, that just completely breaks. You might shy away, you'll be separated from God, but the moment God comes into your life, you know, things change little by little. And you go to the process of probation, you start feeling good, you start feeling whole, the shame goes away, the memories will be there. Because I, I can guarantee memories won't go away, but there's nothing better to have the peace in your heart and the love of Christ. So I'm opening this altar for anybody that wants to come and